heard of the Georgia Guidestones. According to Wikipedia, the Georgia Guidestone was, that should be were, a granite monument that stood in Elbert County. Well, I suppose was is sort of accurate with the word in there. Georgia, United States from 1980 to 2022. It was 19 feet 3 inches tall and made from six granite slabs weighing a total of that many pounds to 137,746. Structure was sometimes referred to as an American Stonehenge. That's interesting there. However, the guidestones in this video are somewhat different, although probably relate to those same alleged physical structures that uh, apparently were in Georgia. Here we look at the entity, the Ohio Guidestone. Now notice that symbol that they have there, where new paths begin. Now I expect that there are similar entities, organizations, business structures, or otherwise, throughout the nation in different states. They might go under a different name, but I guarantee they will all have that Guidestone uh, placed somewhere. As far as Ohio Guidestone goes, it is uh, out in the open, uh, in front of your face, and uh, plain to see. On this website, we find the Ohio Rise. Now, that uh, characterization of Ohio there with the bright red O and scarlet H-I-O is a governmental scheme that you find uh, across uh, all of the Ohio departments, such as with the Department of Transportation or with uh, <clears throat> the uh, the different elements of the Ohio Park Service or wherever. If you look through any of the .gov Ohio websites, you will find that particular characterization of Ohio. So it is indeed an alleged government entity here under the Ohio Rise name. And it states that RISE stands for Resilience Through Integrated Systems and Excellence. Incredibly vague. Ohio RISE Resilience Through Integrated Systems and Excellence is a specialized Medicaid-managed care program that focuses on children who have complex behavioral health and multi-system needs. Now, if you remember in the last video I did about child trafficking, their main focus were, was on children with disabilities. Anyway, in continuation, young people with these needs often require help and services from multiple community systems, which may include juvenile justice, child protection, development disability, schools, mental health, and addiction, and others. Ohio Rise services became available on July 1st, 2022. So yeah, child trafficking. <clears throat> Through uh, the... Uh, corporate Gestapo that goes around and steals people's children uh, through the force of arms and whatnot. <clears throat> anyway, over time, it will mean that kids who deal with complex behavioral health issues do not have to travel across state lines or be in a secured facility. Instead, the goal is to bring their care closer to home in their familiar communities and surroundings. So yeah, basically put a secured facility, quote unquote, in their surroundings and their communities so they don't have to be transported across state lines that's the way that should be worded but they won't word it like that because that will sound far too obvious and sinister this approach builds upon ohio guidestones approach we want care to be more accessible and more manage manageable for children youth and their families coded language for you Eligibility. Children and youth who may be eligible for a high rise include those who are ages 0 through 20. Haha. <laughs> Somebody who is age 0 is eligible. <laughs> that means uh, <clears throat> theft of infants is not without uh, its coverage in this program. Because that's about the only thing that would fit into the 0 age category. Anyway, eligible for Ohio Medicaid, either managed care or fee for service, and requires significant behavioral health treatment needs. Sounds like somebody who doesn't want to comply or go along with uh, dictatorial unlawful mandates would be categorized in the behavioral health treatment needs 
category here. Measured using the Ohio Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths CANS assessment. Children and youth may also be eligible for a high rise due to certain urgent conditions. For example, if a child or youth is in a hospital for behavioral health reason. Now, that's what I mentioned before. Somebody who does not behave according to their standards. Ohio Guides Duncan guide you on how to schedule a CANS assessment. Now here we find out, according to their website, that apparently Ohio Guidestone Care Coordination Services are available only in Cuyahoga County, which is uh, where Cleveland is. However, we will find that that's not true. They are in fact present in many more places than just one. Here it states that Ohio Guidestone is in Barea, Ohio. And down at the bottom, we see that Ohio Rise right next to Aetna, the giant health insurance company. Now, this puts into context the Rise Realty Company, which is scattered throughout nearly the entirety of the state of Ohio and likely into other states as well. According to their website, at Rise Realty, we truly do hustle with heart, considering ourselves go-givers rather than go-getters. It's not simply about getting a sale, listing, or buyers and sellers. It's about giving, giving our time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and most importantly, value. Sounds like they're a lot more than just a real estate company. <laughs> it's not about us. It's about them. The people we work with, our clients, our loved ones. We believe that the highest compliment you will ever pay another human being is to take the time to actively listen, actively observe, and actively care about what is important to that person. Focus on them, listen to them, care about them. What makes Rise, Rise Realty different is our connection with others. Conveniently vague, <clears throat> and they will be saying something else as always, versus what somebody reading it will think they're saying. See, the others they're talking about are foreign interests, and the observation and focus on the people in the community has to do with better caring for their foreign entity interest clients that live in Europe, pretty much. We stand out because of our steadfast commitment to go-giving, but we're also known for our unique, lighthearted, and creative approach to marketing our business in the community. We like to have fun, and that shows in our photo shoots, billboard advertisements throughout the community, and the local events we choose to sponsor and participate in. So yeah, just a facade of the usual. We're rock stars, really, we are. We love what we do, and our passion shines through in our service and our success. Rise Realty is one of the fastest growing brokerages in central Ohio, and it's no wonder why. Our team of experts has the connections should be have creativity integrity and heart to consistently deliver for our clients and our community committed to the communities we call home each of us has the ability to make an amazing difference in the world around us through large projects that impact many people to small monuments in time that mean a lot to just one person giving a, is what makes us great the list of ways we have positively impacted our community is long and our commitment to growing and expanding that list is unwavering so yeah, they are going to keep expanding and keep conquering, basically. And <clears throat> that it's through large projects that impact many people to small moments in time. That sounds pretty creepy when you consider the context of the video. We are especially proud of the Key to Giving, a 501c3 nonprofit, our leader, ship established in 2012 to encourage individuals to find their passion and make positive differences in the world. Through inspiration, collaboration, accountability, and hustling with heart, we help fellow go-givers move an idea from concept into a growing creative expression, expressive passion project that serves those around us. Now notice <clears throat> the name there, the key to giving. The key is the symbol on the Vatican flag, of which there is indeed a church uh, cathedral in 
well, actually, there's many in, throughout Ohio, but uh, one is specifically in Lancaster, which has the flag of the Vatican out front. And it, in the history of the Vatican, we find a lot of the demonstrations of that offering that which is not theirs to give, basically. So the key to giving, that name says it all there. And then, of course, their <clears throat> objective is to make positive differences in the world. That sounds like they are operating on behalf of a foreign entity and probably took that wording from a World Economic Forum style uh, or, or type of propagandist. Here we see that Rise Realty is uh, headquartered or located or whatever. Uh, in Lancaster, Ohio, and they have this MLS disclaimer here. Now moving on to the trademark, Guidestone, Ohio. It was apparently abandoned, and it was listed in the nonprofit entity providing support programs for families, children, and communities. So there you get that uh, very creepy child trafficking angle that we saw before. And it was filed, filed in December 10th, 2012, which is interesting because the Guidestone website talked about how it was, well, it appeared to anyway, uh, be relatively new. Now, the applicant is Guidestone Corporation, of which I could, I don't believe I found that specific filing, but it does list the East Bagley Road, Berea, Ohio, which was listed on their website, and it was filed by David B. Kapar. Apparently, it was abandoned in March 6, 2013. So, Guidestone, Ohio is a trademark. It's not currently active. However, things get a little bit interesting when we look up Guidestone Rise. Now, remember... There was the Ohio Rise, and then there's Rise Realty. And Ohio Rise is connected with Guidestone. And we will notice the theme throughout this video of the shifting names that all link together and provide a maze that leads us to the true owners of this system. And it is for their benefit that things are done against or within the communities served. Now, this was uh, apparently filed on November 12, 2017, much er, sooner uh, <clears throat> than the other ones. And it was apparently published for opposition on April 3, 2018, and then registration date was August 14, 2018. Now, the registrant is Goldschmidt Vineyards, LLC, limited liability company out of California, Halesburg. And John B. Dawson is the uh, attorney of record. So that would not be the uh, owner of Goldschmidt Vineyards or whatever filing it. It would be that attorney right there, John B. Dawson. Likely. Anyway. But either way, it, it doesn't really say who filed it. It just gives a short summary of uh, information. But that name right there, Goldschmidt Vineyards LLC, is important to look at, as is, of course, the trademarked word there, oh, Guidestone Rise. Now, Goldschmidt Vineyard was trademarked in 2003 obviously much earlier but it was abandoned in 2004 and the applicant was that same goldschmidt vineyards llc limited liability company california so that's kind of odd why they would abandon goldschmidt vineyard as a trademark and and then recently file the application for guidestone rise now we come to the filing goldschmidt which was canceled, and this is with Fresh Grapes and Wine in Commerce, under Commerce, filed in 2002 and amended in 2003, and then canceled in 2010. However, this one was filed by Dundee Hills Vineyards, 
LLC limited liability company in Oregon. Now, Oregon is very close to California. We have two vineyards filing under Goldschmidt for the trade mark. This one is Dundee Hills Vineyards and has does, appears anyway to have nothing to do with the name Goldschmidt. So it is interesting that they filed for this name, which they canceled in 2010. So something must be going on there with that name, which we should look into further. Now, another mark trademark was filed, Nick Goldschmidt Selections Goldmark. And this was filed in 2010 and published for our position in 2011 and registered in 2012. And then we also see the same entity filing for this one, Goldschmidt Vineyards LLC out of Hillsburg, California, with also the same name, John B. Dawson. And it states that the name Nick Goldschmidt identifies a living individual whose consent is of record. So that's interesting there. Now we look and see that there is another filing of Goldschmidt by that same entity, Goldschmidt Vineyards, and also the same person again, John B. Dawson, attorney of record. But this one was filed in 2016. And registered in 2016. So, and then this one was done under alcoholic beverages except beers and wines. It's possible that this one is that they do do indeed hold the Goldschmidt, but they also have that Guidestone Rise trademark that they did even more recently. So this takes us to a very interesting article that came in uh, from politic with the or Oregon Live or the Oregonian newspaper in 2004. Facing exposure, Neil Goldschmidt admits sexual relationship with 14-year-old girl while he was mayor of Portland. Now, as is generally the case, whatever is admitted to is the lesser of the evil, and I'm sure there was much worse going on that they will not admit to. And this is sort of a way to spin it to make it less impactful of all of the things that were going on. And this is in 2004. And if we think about all of the nasty and crazy things that have been going on in the last decade, well, <clears throat> such an individual would likely be closely linked. The famous child trafficking rings that have been covered of recent. Former Governor Neil Goldschmidt admitted Thursday that he had a sexual relationship with a 14-year-old girl when he was 35 and mayor of Portland and said he is resigning all his public and private positions to rebuild my life. In an extraordinary and emotional 50-minute interview with the Oregonian, Goldschmidt confessed he has lived for 30 years with the enormous guilt and shame of what he has said was a nine-month relationship. He said deteriorating health, heart arrhythmia, and blocked arteries, and knowledge that media accounts of the affair were about to unfold made him come forward. Yeah, see, there you go. Getting out ahead of it, spinning it, lessening it, <clears throat> and picking the less of the evils being done to make it look not so bad. And then, of course, the <clears throat> alleged reporter or propagandist involved here is doing his part or her part to also diminish the uh, case of whatever happened and make him look like just a sick and sad old person. I'm just living with this personal hell, said Goldschmidt, 63, occasionally choking back tears. The lie has gone on too long. Goldschmidt, who was married at the time of the affair, said he agreed to a financial settlement with the woman who is now 42. He did so after being contacted by the woman's lawyer in 1994. Again, all of this is meant to diminish, so there has to be a lot worse going on, or having have uh, a lot worse must have happened and is likely still going on with this Goldschmidt name. The Oregonian, as a general policy, doesn't identify victims of sex crimes. According to Oregon laws, in effect, in 1975, sexual intercourse with a girl under 16 constituted third-degree rape, a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. Statute of limitations at that time was three years from the commission of the crime. Asked 
Whether he had thought there could be current legal implications as a result of his actions, Goldschmidt said he didn't know of any. Goldschmidt acknowledged that his past behavior will forever blight his political legacy as well as put at risk others associated with his work, including his longtime friend, Governor Ted Kulongski. Or is that Kulongoski? Although Goldschmidt had setbacks, he has been sought after visionary on some of Portland's biggest projects and is considered one of Oregon's savviest political insiders. Yeah, sure. So it is with corrupt people, they're always considered things by other corrupt people that all work together to delude everyone else. At age 32, he became the nation's youngest big city mayor, going on to become transportation secretary for the Carter administration and Oregon governor from 1987 to 1991. He was an executive with Nike and has been a successful international trade consultant since the early 1990s. Throughout his political career, rumors of extramarital affairs circulated around him. Goldschmidt tactfully acknowledged Thursday that the rumors had merit. If people work hard enough, I think you'll find indiscretions, he said, but nothing as ugly as this. He chose not to run for a second term as governor after his first marriage fell apart. His sudden withdrawal from public life just months after being named president, the State Board of Higher Education throws a planned overhaul of the state's university system into disarray. He has resigned from the board and taken a leave of absence from his consulting firm, Goldschmidt Emerson Carter. So yes, just more well-connected individuals who simply go everywhere and do everything despite not being capable themselves. Such is the nature of corruption. It also complicates the proposed sale of Portland General Electric to Texas Pacific Group. Goldschmidt, who is in line to be chairman of a newly appointed board of PGE, should the deal go through, said he will no longer be involved in the transaction. A somber scene. On Thursday, with wife Diana at his side, Goldschmidt quietly disclosed the secret he's kept for three decades. His voice quavering, his face flushed. Goldsmith methodically and bluntly revealed details he knew he could ruin him. He had an affair with an underage girl he lied about it and ultimately was forced to disclose it. Usually a commanding presence, he appeared dejected and defeated, his head often slumping inches from the meeting room table. Joining him for the interview were his business partner Tom Emerson and best friend Jerry Bidwell, a prominent Portland area financier and member of the Oregon Investment Council. All set somberly as Goldschmidt answered questions about the affair. Several times, Diana Goldschmidt reached out and clasped her husband's hand or rubbed his shoulder. Holding a little back, he said the girl was a neighbor and the daughter of a woman who worked on his mayoral campaign. He said they would meet off and on. Interviewed at her home in Nevada, the woman said she babysat for Goldschmidt. She said she had no desire to go into details about the past and declined to discuss any of the issues Goldschmidt brought up. I'm a good person just trying to live my life. I don't want my life screwed up anymore. The relationship began in 1975 and ended sometime in 1976, Goldschmidt said. He did not say why it ended. He said he then had little, if any, contact with her until after he became governor. Goldschmidt said a rumor about the affair surfaced during his 1986 gubernatorial campaign, but it didn't affect the race. But after he took office, he heard that she had been talking about it. She was in a public establishment, and I would presume not entirely in great shape. Telling the world she had a relationship with me. Goldschmidt said at that point he said he arranged to meet with her. He continued to see or talk to her intermittently, but always either on the phone or with others in the room. Ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho, yeah, sure. He said he she never asked for money or any kind of specific help. Then in 1994, her lawyer Jeff Foote of Portland contacted Goldschmidt. She wanted two things, an apology and help starting her life over. Goldschmidt said a conservatorship was established as part of a legal settlement. He said he had to borrow money to fund it. Long time coming, foot on Thursday confirmed the sexual relations while Goldschmidt was mayor and that financial settlement had been reached in 1994. Goldschmidt said he never thought the settlement would end the risk of the relationship becoming public. This day has been a long time coming, he said. Local newspapers, including the Oregonian, have been looking into the affair. William at Week sent Goldschmidt questions about the affair and published a story on its website Thursday that describes the relationship. The Portland Tribune also was working on the story. The story was being spread in many ways that were even more damaging than I supposed I ever could quite imagine, Goldschmidt said, his voice rarely rising above a hoarse whisper. Goldschmidt said he is particularly distressed about letting down Kulongoski, who recruited him to lead a shakeup of Oregon's higher education system. He said he never discussed the affair with the governor. I owe Ted Kulongoski tremendously, Goldschmidt said, and it's a terrible thing I've done to him. Well, 
<clears throat> I'm sure that the extra information, or rather that the ways that this, quote, story was being spread uh, reflect similar things going on with Epstein, where they only ever talked about, you know, the underage girls that were around high school age or whatnot and tried to diminish the entire thing and suppress all evidence, including black books or client lists and everything else that might be far worse than what was reported. He said he submitted his Higher Education Board re resignation letter to Kulongoski on April 26th, in part because of health and in part because he was concerned about the story of the relationship becoming public. He cited health reasons for his departure. <laughs> Sounds uh, similar to a certain individual that didn't kill themselves. Goldschmidt, who has suffered from heart ailments since law school, said his health was gradually worsened over the years. Last fall, he said he suffered a serious episode of arterial fibrillation or irregular heartbeat. He visited the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota in December for a closer diagnosis and was told to change his life by losing weight, exercising, and limiting stress. Two weeks ago, he experienced another atrial fibrillation episode. That's when he concluded he had to slow down. The real issue is I'm trying to avoid a stroke. Goldschmidt said, large measure of the guilt he feels, he said, is because of how much he thinks this will hurt his family, friends, and political associates. Yes, I'm sure it would, because they're probably all clients and whatever little scheme was going on that they're all working to suppress with this article, as we've seen recently. More of the same. Margie Goldschmidt, his wife at the time of the affair, declined on Thursday to say when or how she learned of the relationship. The Goldschmidt's 25-year marriage ended while he was still governor in 1990. A separation shattering re-election plans, but Margie Goldsmith said the affair was not the precipitating factor. He suffered for his behaviors and his actions in many ways, said Margie Goldsmith, 60. This is not a person without a conscience. In no way would I condone this, but it happened a long time ago and certainly was not a pattern of behavior with Neil. Kulangoski commented on Goldsmith's resignation, but did not return phone calls seeking comment on the sexual relationship. His health is his priority right now, and I think that he has made the right decision, the governor said. We owe him a great debt for his service. And then we see that it's highlighted Harry Steve, Gail Kinsey Hill. So those must have been your two alleged uh, propagandists that worked on this article to basically cover up for pedophiles and all of their associates, as mentioned in the article. Now, when we look at business filings, we find under a particular one, Goldschmidt Chemical Corporation, effective date of 2007, under prior business names. Let's go ahead and look at that particular trail of the Goldschmidt entities. Here we see the filing for the Gold Goldschmidt Chemical Corporation. 1999, and this was done under the CSC Lawyers Incorporating Service, or now known as the Corporation Service Company. And it states that the corporation is authorized but not limited to the lawful development, manufacture, production, marketing, distribution, dealing, and selling of chemical products and derivatives. And lo and behold, it is another corporation out of Delaware. As always, Seems to be the case. However, the interesting part of this is that it was notarized in Hopewell, Virginia, by Fred Gilly, to the Goldschmidt Chemical Corporation. In Virginia, we find the Devonic Goldschmidt Corporation, again, Delaware, as we note under jurisdiction, and this has the annual report due date of 2016. It states that it is inactive. Now here, even though it is not the Goldschmidt Chemical Company, we find that it is also with the principal office address in Hopewell, Virginia, which is the location that that other document was in fact notarized in. And it is operated by the Corporation Service Company. A theme is unfolding. Next, we find under the uh, director list that uh, at least 
four are out of Hopewell, Virginia, and two out of New Jersey, allegedly. Notice the name here, Dr. Klaus Rittig. Now, among all the names here, that one is important to pay attention to. The last, or the surname, Rettig, Dr. Klaus. Notice this individual, among all of them, is the only one whose address is listed as a P.O. box. He does not have an address actually listed physically within the place of record. So here we come back to the US United States Patent and Trademark Office to look up the trademark of the name Ivonic Goldschmidt. Here it states Ivonic Goldschmidt. The word Ivonic Goldschmidt has no meaning in foreign language. Chemical is used in industry, science, and photography, chemicals for use in the biochemical and chemical industry, in particular chemical bases and intermediate chemicals used in the pharmaceuticals industry and the cosmetics industry. And here we have a very, very, very long list of various chemicals being listed. Uh, pigments, paint colorings, uh, various types of uh, corrosive and non-corrosive uh, materials, and quite a lot of things that would be used in construction, cosmetics, uh, tempering, I see it says there as well, enzymes. And, of course, a lot of things that could be used for very damaging and detrimental operations to not only the environment, but the human populace is at large. And this company will find is anything but local. Unsurprisingly, the owner of this trademark is the Ivonic Industries AG Corporation, a joint stock company out of Germany. Rellinghauser Strauss. Essen, uh, and see there you have the uh, alleged address. Now, as the attorney record, it states that it's Scott D. Waldo, and it was apparently, <clears throat> well, states priority date is 2008, and it does state that the names, portraits, and or signatures shown in the mark do not identify a particular living individual. Now, isn't that an interesting note? And it was canceled in 2018. So, when we go back to Ohio, we find the Ivonic Goldschmidt Corporation uh, listed as a foreign corporation. However, it is listed as a foreign corporation, not internationally foreign, but domestically foreign because the location is listed as Delaware and not, of course, Germany, because that would be a problem. Now, going to the company's house out of the United Kingdom. We find the company name Gerber Goldschmidt Group International Limited. And here we have registered agent addresses for Britain. Now, interestingly, in this document, we find that the name was changed to GGG Investments LTD, formerly Gerber Goldschmidt Group LTD, LTD meaning limited. Going back to Virginia, we find GGG Investments, LLC, a limited liability company. Now, what's interesting is that limited and limited liability company are essentially the same things with only a slight variation in the letters that are appended or amended or added to the name, whereas we have LLC in the United Kingdom and Europe, it would be limited LTD, but it's virtually the same thing. Anyway, this one was formed in 2007 and has a due date for August 31st, 2023, and it is apparently pending and active because the annual registration fee is past due. Now, interestingly, the registered agent on file, David W. Kundravitz, is allegedly a member of the Virginia State Bar. So go figure, what a surprise. The uh, bar members all heavily involved with these corrupt schemes, just as our uh, members of academia, PhDs and professors, uh, upper level, uh, level, uh, upper level individuals in the so-called law enforcement schemes, and naturally reverends and priests. 
Now this takes us to a particular filing in Ohio again. And this would be Degusa, Alabama Incorporated. Again, we see there the CT Corporation system. Always have one of those entities usually anyway involved. And this is dated 1977. It states that Degusa, Alabama Incorporated is uh, formed in, in Alabama and the principal office is a P.O. box number. And that this is out of Cuyahoga County, Cleveland. No surprise can, since the, uh, if you remember the, uh, allegedly the Ohio Guidestone entity operates out of Cuyahoga County. And it says that their uh, work is general sales activity directly and through agents and distributors. Now, also remember that under that Virginia business filing, the guy with Retig was the only one who had a P.O. box listed for his address. All of the other ones actually had a physical address listed. Now, the name, current name of this is the Avonic Corporation, originally filed in 1977 as what we looked at before out of Alabama. We see under prior business names, the Degusa Corporation, Degusa Halls Corporation, Degusa Corporation, and the Ivonic Degusa Corporation, now just the Ivonic Corporation. Going to the UK uh, company's house filing again, we find the Ivonic Degusa GmbH. Here it lists Rellinghauser Strass 5 S in Germany. The same location for the filing for the trademark name that correlates to this entity and the other ones in the chain of names that we've looked at. And this was done where the director was appointed on 21st of May 2011. But notice the registration number. It begins with DE, which are coincidentally also the first or the, the letters that form the abbreviation for Delaware. But the registered location of this entity is in Germany. However, when we dig further into this topic, we find out that it is not in fact Germany that we're looking at, but lo and behold, it is Switzerland, which is the land of the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, and all of the other little corrupt, skeevy, mischievous corporate uh, agents that operate the rather awful global juridic empire, which is all based off of the mandates of the Vatican. Here it states that it is a private company limited by shares out of Switzerland, Heindel Register des Cantons Zurich. Cantons, of course, being the uh, legal entity state of Switzerland. And it says it's under the Swiss Code of Obligations. But let's look further. Now, notice here, it states, under director details, Thomas Mueller. Now, the reason why that last name is so important is because there's a Cardinal Mueller. There is also a uh, high-up-level CEO individual in the United States that operates in the higher education sector with also the last name Mueller. And again, there is also that uh, attorney person who was very uh, well publicized during the last decade, also with the last name Mueller or the or Mueller. Most people would say Mueller, the Mueller report. Mueller, Mueller, regardless, it's the same spelling. And we're finding individuals with the same last name, all involved in the same schemes that all relate back to Germany and Switzerland on behalf of entities within the United okay. States. And they are not a low level henchmen in this case. Now, when we look down at the other names in this document, we find Bernd Lemmert and Klaus Rittig. Klaus Rittig was the name, or doctor, name, that was listed under the Virginia filings with a P.O. box out of Virginia rather than a physical address. This Klaus Rittig 
is a foreign national residing in Switzerland, but listed as a domestic director on a Virginia business filing. That is fraud, but I guarantee there are other things afoot. There's, there would be a reason why they would want that individual to be as uh, insulated against this. Uh, and, and it is indeed a maze and very difficult to track and find this particular information. Finally, here we have the file copy for the Certificate of Registration of an Overseas Company uh, in the United Kingdom, Evonik Degusa International AG, given at Company's House on 20th of December, 2012. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channels, and check out my other content. There are free books available at the link, and if so, if you uh, so choose, you may support my work at Cash App and buy me a coffee. Apparently, I no longer have any access to PayPal.